Welcome everybody, I'm Joel Griggs from the True Crime Museum at White Rock. Uh, down by the pier and close to the palace, what you might have previously known as the Pig in Paradise pub. We're just alongside that, set in some seaside caves cut into the cliff face down there. We've been open for about three years and I am leaving plenty of leaflets and two pound off vouchers plug plug on the tables at the back there that table and the piano there we go so uh, you'll be able to get a discount and come along and see us when um, Tim asked me to do the talk today he spoke about um, uh, passions and he wanted people speaking about their obsessions and passions and mine is obviously that of true crime and um, I'm going to speak to you tonight about how that passion came about and how the museum at White Rock came to be open. Um, I worked in education for a good number of years down here in Hastings and was made redundant and first got the idea of opening up a bookshop perhaps down George Street. My redundancy money didn't cover the rents down George Street so I went looking a little bit further afield and found the caves at White Rock. The pier had just uh, burned and rents were very cheap down there and the place was a complete and utter state. Um, it was full of rubbish and full of uh, all sorts of strange goings on. But we cleared it out, as I say, this was about three years ago and filled it with an assortment of exhibits, artifacts, displays relating to true crime and the subject of crime. Some of it is very, very gory, some of it is a little bit less uh, intense, but the story I'm going to tell you tonight is a particularly gory story and one that has a very, very personal uh, attachment to myself and my family and a connection with myself and my family it is the story of John Child's death bath, which was one of the first exhibits um, that I gathered together for um, the, the True Crime Museum. It was one of the last ones to go in there uh, because I had to negotiate with my family to, um, to get it in there. But the story is that of John Childs who was a bank robber in East London back in the 1970s. We seem to have got stuck on that slide, Tim. Um, but uh, there will be a photo of him come up in a moment. He was a very bizarre man and he lived about two or three doors down from my great uncle, Arthur Gray, who lived in Dolphin House in Poplar in East London. And that's where I grew up on the uh, East London sort of Essex borders. This was 1975 when Charles was committing most of his crimes. I actually witnessed him committing a bank robbery. I didn't know it at the time. I was uh, riding my bike with a friend in uh, Woodford Green in Essex Borders, East London, and we saw three men in balaclavas and boiler suits burst out of a uh, branch of Barclays Bank down George Lane in um, South Woodford. As I say, I didn't really know. I was only sort of six, uh, seven years old at the time. Didn't really know what was going on, but was later told that this was the Childs McKenney gang. Back in that era of the 70s and into the early 80s, bank robberies and um, raids on security vans, armed raids were very, very popular. Obviously in an era of more cash being around and less security and less CCTV and so on, um, gangs of armed robbers would go into branches of banks or hold up security vans with a sawn off shotgun, they'd chop the, chop the stock off it, chop the barrel off it, conceal it within their clothing, draw it out, um, fire off a shot which would either um, injure or scare to death the staff and they would hand over um, bags full of cash which, we, which the robbers would then abscond with. So I saw them doing this. The Charles McKenney gang were very, very active in the mid-70s in and around the Middlesex, Essex and East London areas. And on one occasion they held up a Securicor van in Hertfordshire. 
um, and it was a very, very botched robbery. What they did was they um, threatened some Securicor staff and um, held up the van and absconded with a lot of money, ran off down a um, alleyway with a lot of money in carrier bags. They wrapped their um, balaclavas, their gloves and their boiler suits in um, black plastic bags, tossed them over a fence and um, carried on running down the alleyway. Unfortunately, in the pocket of one of the boiler suits was the keys to the BMW getaway car. So not a particularly bright thing to do. And what happened was that the um, garden that they were tossed into, the owner of that garden found the black plastic bag, found the boiler suits, found the BMW car keys, handed them over to the police and the police um, traced the owner of the BMW vehicle through the car keys. They pulled him in his identity we will never know, and you'll, you'll understand why when I continue this story. Uh, they said, right, we've got you banged to rights for this security vehicle hold up. Uh, and he called his solicitor and said, okay, um, give me immunity from this crime and I will tell you about something which will make the hairs on the back of your neck stand on end. And he proceeded to tell them a tale of how one of his accomplices in this robbery and in the uh, eponymous Charles McKenney gang and I will point him out when he comes up on the slides he's the uh, slightly elfin looking man I think he's in the next slide with the glasses and the wispy beard John Childs who has set himself up as the East London Butcher that was the title that he gave himself in the 70s what he did was he got um, the word round East London clubs and pubs and boxing clubs and said I would get rid of anybody, no questions asked, no trace of the body for £1,200 which is about the equivalent of £1,500 now. And the orders started coming in. The first person that he executed was his ex-cellmate at Wandsworth Prison, and there is a slide of him coming up, he's the gentleman um, bulking out his muscles, not him, um, against the 70s style wallpaper, I'll just point that out when it comes up, a guy called Terence Teddy Bear Eve. Now what had happened was, um, Terence Eve was uh, a cellmate of um, Childs in Wandsworth, as I say, in the early 70s, he'd come out and gone straight. He'd set up a teddy bear manufacturing, a soft toy manufacturing um, factory in a, uh, in a church hall, rather, in Dagenham. And he was, there he is, Terence Teddy Bear, the first of Child's victims. So when Child's eventually got out of Wandsworth Prison, um, Terence Eve offered him a job in the teddy bear factory. Charles took that job, but after a couple of months, decided that he didn't want the job, he wanted the whole factory. So he invited uh, Eve back to his flat at 13 uh, Dolphin House in Poplar, which is where that bath came from, and he plied him with alcohol, plied him with um, scotch, and when Eve, who was a very, very big man, um, started to become the worst for wear, Charles attacked him with some ornamental, and you can see them in that slide when it comes back on again, uh, some ornamental weapons. He had a crossbow, a uh, mace, the Sikh daggers, the names of which I can never remember, but they're those sort of um, leaf-shaped daggers, and a harpoon. And eventually he dispatched uh, Terence Eve he took a very bizarre character. He will tell you he's done everything from founding ISIS to leading Charles Manson on a murder spree. He's a very, very eccentric character. I think he's about 78 now, but he is still with us, yeah. Where, where, whereabouts is he? I think he's in HMP Franklin up in Cumbria, but they move him around quite a lot. Fantastic. So just 
is where you can say St. Leonard's Norman Road. <laughs> well, there is a St. Leonard's connection in the sense that we were offered another death bath. Um, and I'll watch what I say here because it might be a bit close to home, but um, there was a character called Christopher Hunnisett who um, yeah. killed a um, local member of the clergy locally, and we were offered that bath. But we thought two baths would be overkill and it would be a little bit too close to home, so we declined that kind of a... What's the fascination with baths and, and criminals? Is, there a, is, there a, is it just convenient? Is it convenient? It is the convenience aspect, I would guess, and we've all got one, or most people have got a bath, so lumping someone into it and then disposing of a dead body would be, uh, it's the most convenient sort of domestic way of doing it, I would guess. Fantastic. Any, any more questions? Far from one bar related or yes, over yes. Yeah. Um, Joe, was it really famous at the time? I, said, I don't remember anything. No, it wasn't. It's not been very widely reported. We recently contributed to one of these crime and investigation channels um, documentaries on it, but no, it wasn't particularly widely reported. The most re um, the most coverage the most coverage it got was when. Henry McKenney and a chap called Terry Pinfold were released because they were convicted of the same crimes by the investigative um, journalism of a Guardian reporter. Um, and it was brought back and it was appealed. But they had done um, about uh, 20 years inside. They were both fairly nefarious characters. And I think in that day and age, the police, if they wanted to put you away for something, and I'm not sure it happens these days, I can't say, I wouldn't comment, but these were dirty characters and the police decided that they were going to stick them for whatever. Thank you very much, and, and good with the sound effects over there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very good, that's very good. Yeah. Any last questions for, uh, for Joel before we take another, another break? Yes, one, one down here, final question. Okay, most prized exhibit. We've got the ashes of a fighting monkey from an arena called the Westminster Pit, which is detailed by Dickens in some of his works. Um, it comes from about sort of 1860, the Victorian era, when a lot of um, Navy personnel and the, you know, Britannia rules the waves and all that kind of stuff in the era of our uh, empire and, and commonwealth and so forth and a lot of uh, sailors were bringing back animals um, it was the period when zoological gardens were set up obviously but some unlucky animals ended up in fighting pits the most notorious of which was the Westminster pit right next to uh, Westminster Abbey Westminster at the time was an even more appalling area than it is now and uh, was rife with sort of child prostitution, robbery, absolutely no sanitation whatsoever. And there was a uh, fighting pit called the Westminster Pit in which um, both rich and poor people would gather to pit badgers against um, Staffordshire Bull Terriers, bears against badgers and dogs and bulls and all sorts of things in place money on, on who was going to win the contest. And um, Jacko Macaco was quite a, that's the name of the chimpanzee, and I always defies belief when you think of sort of Michael Jackson and his fascination with chimpanzees. And people say to me, you've got to be taking the mickey, this is not a monkey called Jacko Macaco, but indeed it is, and it's quite celebrated um, in the era. Uh, so we've got the ashes of Jacko, and that came from a, um, lecturer who was his great 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 grandfather or one of his ancestors was a uh, merchant seaman and came back with his monkey and put him into the pit and bet on uh, who would win and he fought 12 bouts killing 12 dogs and then in the 13th one was was killed so yeah that's a one of my well i would say favorite exhibits it's a, it was actually led to the first piece of anti animal cruelty legislation in the world which happened in this country, so I suppose we can be uh, proud of that. Fantastic. There we are. A positive note on which to, uh, <laughs> to, 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 to end.